destroyed. Then is the question would be, is the creation of the universe, is the creation of the universe produce a universe where life was merely possible? Or did it produce a universe where life was inevitable? We see life appears, just look in the mirror. But the reality, the question does remain, was that inevitable or merely, or merely a possibility? A major problem, is there any objective evidence for God's self-revelation? Is there any evidence that is purely objective, that a skeptic could take and see that, in fact, there was a revelation by God? Those data are hard to come by. The final question that a skeptic might present would, from a biblical point of view is the archaeological record is astonishingly deplete with evidences of this self-revelation. So now just to jump quickly into a few of those, to expand on a few of those, those questions, about why is there existence? Well, that's a question we can't answer easily, or perhaps at all. The fact is we live in existence as the fish live in the water, and if there were not existence, obviously we wouldn't be asking the questions. Then the, the, reality, the question would then be, but the universe that is created is so finely tuned, what are the implications? Well, we talked about this once before. Scientific American thinks the fact that the universe is so finely tuned is simply because there are many universes. Parallel universes really exist. There are many universes, and most universes may not have life. But our universe is just right for life, and therefore uh, we have life in one of the universes of the many that exist. The logic, which we talked about once before, is quite extraordinary. Scientific American, the article by There Are Many Universes, and here is the logic in one of the arguments, in four-color printing, so it shouldn't be missed by the reader of the journal, which I would think when you look at the logic, the editors might have been happier if, in fact, it had been overlooked by the reader. Evidence for other universes. Cosmologists infer the presence of, of parallel universes by scrutinizing the properties of our universe. These properties, including things like gravity, the strength of the forces of nature, the number of observable dimensions of space, length, width, height, and the dimension of time, those four dimensions. So, the, these properties were established by random processes. You have to get the mindset here. These properties were established by random processes during the birth of the universe. Yet they have exactly the values that sustain life. So Scientific American realizes that the most widely read materialist journal Materialist organization or orientation, most read, read science journal in the world, establishes that in fact, yet these properties of nature have exactly the values that sustain life. What's the deduction from this from materialist, a materialist point of view? This suggests, since these values are exactly right to sustain life, that there must be other universes that have other values and don't sustain life. Hence, the cover can say, Parallel universes really exist. Well, that level of logic, since our universe is good, there must be bad universes, is about as convoluted as one can imagine in the uh, lo development of a logic of why there's a universe. Next would be on, the, on, the, on this agenda of trying to just quickly go through this whole flow from a creation to uh, our existence. The Big Bang did not produce one iota of solid matter. It didn't produce... It didn't produce protons and neutrons and electrons. It produced light beams, super energetic light beams, electromagnetic radiation. And these light beams eventually became alive. Now, it is quite a stretch of the imagination that light beams can become alive by themselves, but all of physics holds by that. Interestingly, there are ancient commentaries that hold by it also, but just stay with, uh, let's stay with the physics of today. The Big Bang produces light beams, somehow, by the discovery of Albert Einstein, the famous equation E equals mc squared, the light beams become solid particles of, high, of quarks, they become protons, neutrons, we have electrons, we now have the building blocks of atoms, a proton actually is the nucleus of a hydrogen, these protons, neutrons, electrons ra ra rapidly draw together, we get hydrogen and helium, there are some nuances in the process which lock the universe in after the first four, three or four minutes to be primarily almost entirely, in fact, hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen is great for making stars, but it's not good for making people. It just doesn't carry it off. You need things like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, 
potassium, calcium, the heavier elements. So what happens? In the alchemy of stars, as the gravity pulls together, pulls together this hydrogen, and, and helium squeezes it tighter, tighter, and the hydrogen is used up, and the star implodes and explodes. In these, in these processes within the furnace of the stars, the hydrogen and the helium, almost like nuclear Lego blocks, are built into heavier, heavier elements. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, barium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, up the periodic table, and the elements of life now are in the universe, made from the hydrogen of the creation, which was made from the energy, the light beams of creation. So now we have light beams manifesting themselves as the heavier the elements. These elements over eons and many processes in stars finally get drawn together in this corner of the universe. Sun forms in the center. Rocky planets, one the third one out, Mercury, Venus, Earth, just at, a planet just at the right distance from the sun to have a, 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 com a temperature commensurate with liquid water. Not so hot that the water evaporates, not so cold that the water is locked in ice, just far enough away from the sun, so the gravitational force of the sun on the earth doesn't lock the earth, so the same face always faces the sun, which can be devastating. The moon's face, we only see one face of the moon from the earth, because it's locked gravitationally by tidal forces, so that it's, as it goes around the earth, the same face always forms it. Mercury has the same face facing the sun, primarily, almost almost only. Venus also, they're both too close. The Earth just happens to squeeze just far out into a habitable zone where it can rotate on its axis, thus distributing the intense energy of the sun over the entire surface, has just the right tilt, of, an excellent tilt of the, of the axis so that heat is distributed winter, spring, summer, and form, or fall over both hemispheres, has a, a, one of the largest moons in the solar system, which helps maintain the stability of this 23-degree this angle tip tilt that gives us so beautifully this distribution of heat. And on this Earth, which is so lovelyly tuned for life, as Scientific American points out, rocks and water, a few simple molecules, perhaps some clay, methane, ammonia, nitrogen, water, and rocks become alive. Of course, those rocks and water weren't always rocks and water. Before that, before the Earth and the solar system formed, they were stardust of previously exploded stars. And before this, they, they were the hydrogen and helium, which is produced in the Big Bang. And before this, they were beams of energy. See, everything you see around you is condensed energy. You're made of light beams. The fact that there was one physical creation, and science is unequivocal about this, there was one physical creation. The stuff that makes up your body and the world around you, the chair you're sitting on, the floor on which the chair rests, has been in the universe since the creation. You witnessed the creation of the universe. You were present at the creation, not in your bodily form, but in the form of light beings that eventually became alive, learned to send people to the sun, to the moon, learned to create a, a violin concerto that can so beautiful it can move a person to tears, all from condensed light beings. It's quite a stretch of the imagination that this merely happened by itself. But that's the understanding from a mater materialist, reductionist point of view. Light beams became alive, and somehow, not only did they become alive, but they became cognizant of being alive, cognizant of awareness, of joy. Light beams can laugh and feel joy. Light beams can sing. Light beams can love. But that's what happened, because the only thing that's the, the substrate of this universe is light beams, and that's what we're made of. So the light beams became alive. I guess it could happen by chance. Certainly the New Yorker thinks so. Here's the picture, the famous example of monkeys hammering away on typewriters. Most of what they write will be garbage, but very occasionally you're going to get a monkey like this. See how happy he is? He's smiling. He got the Shakespeare sonnet. The famous adage, Put enough monkeys away, let them hammering away on typewriters. Most of what they write will be garbage, but very occasionally, by pure chance, they will type out one of Shakespeare's sonnets. It takes the back of an, of an envelope to do the calculation that that will never happen, notwithstanding that the largest, the most widely sold science book ever written, Brief History of Time by Stephen Dawking, tells us along the way that the whole universe can be done exactly like that. Monkeys hammering away on typewriters, can, by chance, we can produce the universe, so much so that the New Yorker felt, well, we're going to get one eventually. You can take any one of the sonnets, 
and realize it would take 